for us to have the assurance to know him and it's going to be glory for us but that's not unfortunately it's not what we are warned about in our passage this morning as we turn to matthew chapter 24 and we look at the end of this particular chapter now i don't know how many of you are kind of keeping up with some of these things but we're actually in part four of a series called the end times and we've been following Jesus since chapter 4 of Matthew when Christ began to call his disciples and said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And then we talk about great crowds that followed the Lord. And, and then we come to our current situation here in, two, in 2020 and we wonder what that means for us to follow Christ in our day. And we've been studying the, the, the book of Matthew, and, and the whole idea is following him to where? Now, a lot of people say, well, we follow him all the way to the cross. And I understand that we need to do that, but that was even difficult for the disciples of his day, and we have learned that. But the real issue is not so much the cross. Yes, we go there, but Jesus didn't end at the cross. And so, glory be to his precious name, following him means going further than the cross. And when we study the end times, we begin to understand more of where we're going with the Lord. So this becomes vital to people that know Christ, but I want to also emphasize that it's vital for people that do not know Christ that we become vigilant in the end times. So here we are in Matthew chapter 24, because we um, we have, and I'll reference this again, but up in, in um, verse 3 of chapter 24, the disciple says, when shall these things be? What, how's, how are we going to know when this happens? What, what's going to transpire that will allow us, give us a clue as to what is taking place? And Christians have been asking that all along through history. It's been like we've been wanting a sign. We've been wanting a road map. We want a clue. We want something that will tell us when is this going to happen? How is it going to happen? How is it going to affect us? Everything we need to know about those things, I didn't say every detail is here, but everything we need to know is encapsulated in Scripture. So therefore, we want to know what these things were. Now, last week, we talked about Israel. We talked about what is going to take place with Israel. And we talked about it being the springtime because it was a fig tree. And the figs, the fig tree was starting to bloom again. It was starting to uh, bud out. And so we begin to understand that Israel has come back onto the scene as in 1948, recognized as a nation, and it said that this generation is not going to pass away. And we discussed those things. Now, I just say that as a review. I'm not saying that to say we're going to preach that or we need to again. Just saying that this is a continuation of what we know to be the Olivet Discourse, and Jesus is continuing that message. So if you've got Matthew chapter 24, we're going to begin right at verse 37 where we cut off last week. And we're going to finish the chapter today as the Lord wills. And if you would, let's stand in honor of God's um, word and let's begin to see what he wants to speak to our hearts about this morning. I just have to say a word about the fellows that are working on this pulpit. And every week there's just a little bit of a difference to it. I notice it more than anybody else, of course. Um, I, and I just want to say, I didn't say thank you to some of the other things, but I appreciate it. They have, uh, you just, you need to walk up here and look and, and see they're, they're doing a magnificent job and I appreciate it. We're in, we're in verse 37. But as the days of the Lord, so shall the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the flood. Thank you. 
begin to smite his fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him. And in an hour, when he is not blind, he shall cut him aside and appoint him for his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be no nation of the king. What a grim prospect to just think that. One is going to be taken and one left. And that's what we want to explore is those two groups that are assigned at the coming of the Lord. One will be taken and one left. And this is by the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's, let's let those come to us as we continue to uh, explore this passage this morning. Dear Father, in Jesus' name, we ask, Lord, that we might not just get the context, that we might not just get the, uh, the word study, but Lord, the message that you have for us today, and that there would be an urgency that we would leave with that would tell us, Lord, exactly what we need to do, because one will be taken and one left, and we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. The sign that becomes an answer to God's people is what Jesus is talking to. Remember, he's speaking to his disciples primarily at this particular time. He's not, he's not speaking in a Billy Graham crusade. He's not speaking to a large number. He's speaking primarily to a group of people about a topic that was of interest to them. Now, I've never found it very hard to find out that Christians are interested in when the Lord is coming and uh, in the rapture of the church. That has never, ever been a problem to get an interest in those kinds of things. So here is what Jesus says is an important sign. And the first important sign that he brings up is the sign of Noah and the flood. And that's what he says. Here the Lord just reminds us of what should be a common knowledge. And, and I would tell you that it seems to me that in schools and in, in particular areas of um, influence with the education, one of the first things that evolution does is try to debunk or they try to bring down the possibility of a deluge, just a, a worldwide flood, uh, the impossibilities of that. They, they try to do everything from explain it as being in one location. And I would just tell you that if it covered the mountains of Ararat, that that was quite a tide surge. That, that would be an amazing kind of thing for that to happen. We, we get 20, 30 feet around a, a hurricane, but if you're thinking about thousands of feet over a mountain range, that's quite a tide surge, isn't it? Uh, and we know these terms in our day because of weather forecasts and things, and we're familiar with how that would work. It, it just seems like there would have to be more water for it to even build up to be over those particular mountains somewhere. And 40 days of rain and the breaking up of the deep, these are familiar things to us from Genesis 4, 5, 6, 7. We, we understand these things and know them uh, as to what has happened. We were in, um, in one of our uh, national uh, reserves one time and and, uh, and the guides, it's always amazing to me, they can, they can spout all of the things that, are, um, that they tell you and they talk about uh, the facts of the sediments and the different times. And, and they always think that everything was here and that it eroded down. And then they'll say, well, during this particular time, during the Iron Age, and these are these sediments. What they don't understand is that some people read and, and understand some things. And I was standing there, and they had these little telescopes, these little tubes. Do you remember this? And they had little tubes. You could look, and you could see one particular layer. It'd be like looking at these concrete blocks over here on the wall. And they say, okay, and one would be focused at this, this particular level and say, if you'll notice here, this was during this time, and this was during this time, and this was during this time, and, and all the evolution that had come down, and it had cut away by the rivers, and, and uh, all these things. And we know this to be prehistoric. And then... And, um, and of course, I, they, you know, anybody have any questions? And I said, yes, why is it that in the Himalayas we have these exact same sedimentary layers, but they're in a different order? And, you know, you get this stare. I, I said, I mean, I said, we know that. 
And I said, and they're different in South America. You know, they're different in Africa. Why, why are you saying that that has to be at that particular level and they're in a different order? It'd be like I stacked books in a different order, but I say it means the same thing all over the earth. That doesn't make sense. But a worldwide deluge does make sense as to the sloshing and the water and where things would, would have the sediment of some things. And he said, well, there are some people that have some different theories. And I said, and I, I said, because there was a group of people around, and I said, so you are saying that this is a theory, that it's not fact, because it can't be a fact. Well, yeah, you know, and I, I said, I understand you're being trained to do this, and I understand why, but it is a theory. You know, you, you just, and folks, sometimes we take biblical accounts. My point here is this. We take biblical accounts, and then we just kind of think, we have to defend them. No, we don't. But we do have to be aware of them. It's amazing to me that we can read and understand from the time we're little bitty about Noah and the flood and know so little about it. That is amazing. And we should know this. And Jesus assumed that his disciples knew about the flood. Now, folks, they only had the Old Testament. And they didn't all carry around a Bible. But they were all assumed to know about the account of Noah and his day and the flood and what brought it on. And so sometimes when we talk about our day and what it means in the end of time and we're referred to this, we don't even know what we are talking about. And that should be a shame to us as believers in Jesus Christ. He just says, these things should be common knowledge. As it was in the days of Noah, here it is. And he points that out, and he says, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. That. Now, this is what it's going to be like when I come. Now, let me remind you, let me remind you of some terms from last week, okay? Just a reminder of what's going on. The coming, that, that is the rapture of the church, the coming of the Lord. The return, the second coming of the Lord, is the beginning, it's the end of the tribulation and the beginning of the millennium. Okay? The coming of the Lord is the rapture of the church, the beginning of the tribulation. The return of the Lord means his bodily coming to the earth. That's the beginning of the millennial reign. It's at Armageddon and it's the end of the tribulation. Two terms that you need to know and uh, you need to be able to converse with because it says that the coming of the Son of Man, that the rapture of the church, that's important for us to know why these events and how we can understand them. This was different. This was new things to the disciples because of their Old Testament um, input. These are the things that, that are going on here. Now, the point is, is that the condition on earth is... At the time of the return, the rapture of the church is going to be like the conditions were during the days of Noah. So we have to know about Noah in order to know what it's going to be like when the rapture of the church, when we expect that. So we have to know those particular things. Now, what about, what do we need to know? And what were those days of Noah like? How, how were they? Uh, understand that the days of Noah also were long. Just, you say, well, you know, God said he was going to come, but he hasn't come. Do you understand God's merciful uh, presence was upon the earth for 120 years? That's longer than your lifetime and mine. Where God extended his mercy while Noah was preaching. It was a time of great mercy of the Lord. Understand that to begin with. People did not respond. There were not converts during that time. But Noah was faithful in the building of the ark to continue to preach righteousness. Uh, Peter tells us that. But he also lived during a time of a pornographic society. I've mentioned this before, and I say this again, and I'm going to encourage our men, not just because they are more susceptible, but because they are leaders, and we need to be strong in this. But men, we need to get involved in the Bible study when we uh, begin to uh, see this thing come up in our church, uh, when we study the book clean. We need to be pure in our society. We need to be pure in our church. We need to be pure in our homes. And men, we need to be pure before holy God. But they lived in a pornographic society. At one time, I've not looked it up early uh, since uh, 
of recent, you know, the last couple of years, but at one time, 3,000 new porn sites were being added to the internet every day. Every day. So just because you may not see it and you may not be influenced by it does not mean that we don't live in a pornographic society. Uh, some of the worst are in other places. They're not, uh, I'm saying in America, just because we have some laws and things that may even kind of control some of that, that doesn't mean that in India or in Europe or other places where it just runs rampant, that uh, it's, it's in your face. We had some, uh, an, an, I had a nephew that went to Belgium and there were literally streets where they could not walk down the streets in normal cities where you would just think, why is it, why can't we just do this? But people just doing business, but every other shop was just a porn shop. And you and I would be offended by that. And we are offended by the actions of people that are acting immoral. But this is the kind of society that Noah lived in. And we think just because it wasn't in print, folks, you don't need that you, for you to just believe that everything's about our personal uh, pleasure. And this is what he lived in. Lot's day is compared to this day in Luke chapter 17. And it, in fact, Jesus in this same discourse over in Luke, it's recorded, remember Lot's wife? He's, he says in the days of Noah, he said, but do you remember Lot's wife? And you have to remember that Lot was... Uh, also a, a marker of the signs before the return of the Lord. And they lived in a town of sexual perversion. You remember that the, the, the men of the Lord that left Abraham went in and the men of that city said, would you send them out that we may know them? Now, folks, you don't have to have a huge uh, imagination, but those adults to understand that as Adam knew Eve and for a man to know a man, that is, that is the height of perversion. And we wonder why... Uh, when we think about homosexuality, lesbianism, and, and transgenderism, and all the things that go on, and we believe in rights, and, and uh, we have to take uh, diversity training, and all kinds of things to, in order to desensitize us, and to make us accepting of a perverted lifestyle, that's the day of Lot. That's the day of Noah. But it sounds very much, and is the day of today, isn't it? where those things would have been shut down not too far past, but today we fight to, through our court system, our legal system, to be sure that we do not offend them, never mind what is an offense to a holy God. You see, it doesn't matter if it offends me. That's, that's immaterial. It ought to offend me as a believer in Christ, but the real key is, is that it offends God. And so, and it's because of the mercy that's being extended to someone and it's being rejected. That is the key to what we're talking about. Now, both are common in our society. They're here in the U.S. It's, and folks, I want to express again, it's not just here. It's all around the world. We live in a perverted society. You may say, well, let's, and I, I've heard it this morning, and I agree, I agree. We need to pray for our government, for our leadership, for wisdom, for moral purity. We need to do that. But folks, may I just push you a little further. We need that in all areas of life and around the world. Um, it's not just drugs that are a problem in Mexico. Moral perversion leads that oftentimes. Whenever you have pharmakeia in the word of God, it always goes with a sexual perversion and breaking down of morals. And whenever you think about, we say, oh, sex trafficking, isn't that rough? That's, that's, that is so abominable. It is, but a lot of times that's because they're putting people into sexual perversion, but the only way they can do it is to get someone hooked on drugs. Folks, evil all is intertwined. And it is worldwide, and it is awful in any kind of description that we can put on it. So, there's several things that mark the days of Noah, but the Lord points to one particular thing, and I think it's worthy of our attention, as the Lord Jesus says this, because it's particular, and it's in verse 39. For as in the days of, excuse me, and they knew not 
until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. All of these things were taking place. All this wickedness was going on. But the real key is, is they knew not because they had come, become immersed in their own humanism, their own materialism, their own self-gratification. And as they became immersed in that, they had no knowledge of what God was about. And so here's the flood coming. Here's an ark being built right before their eyes. And it starts to rain and they go, hey, who, what? How's this happening? What's going on? And they had heard it, and they had heard it, and they had been under the exposure of God's mercy day after day for 120 years. You see, what had happened, there was just no room left for God. It's, it sounds like our world at the time of the Lord's birth. Here comes Mary, here comes Joseph, and there was no room for them in the end. There was no room for our Lord then, and there's very little room for God today. And we have to understand, that is a sign of the time. Then we don't have room. It's, we'll be at church if it's convenient. We'll give if it's convenient. We will um, we'll, um, put this, if nothing comes up, uh, we'll pray if we have time. You see, what we're really saying is, is we have a priority and God will work you in when we can. That happens not only out in the world, that happens... That happens inside churches. We were watching a video of the War Room, which I highly recommend. If you've not seen it, you need to get it. You need to view it on prayer and spiritual warfare. But um, one, one line in that, there was a guy that says, Will I see you in church? And the guy responds and he says, Maybe. And the fellow that he was talking to, he says, That means no. And you know what that means? Somebody says, well, if I get a chance, I'll see you. If I have the opportunity, what people are really saying is, unless I can think of something else better to do, maybe I'll come. There's no room. And I, don't, wouldn't, I wouldn't even ask, but I would dare say that probably everyone in this room has heard an excuse like that. I will if I can. I will see. I will try. Or will, if, you know, Whatever. And we hear that, and it becomes discouraging to those of us. But I will tell you that there's an occasion when sometimes we do hear some things that are encouraging, or we see some things where people are responding to the Lord, or they get saved. Noah preached that for 120 years, and nothing happened. Nothing. The excuses went away. And that's one of the things that God is telling us from Jesus. There is just no room. They knew not. But... That's, that's not an excuse for our day or our present day because God says, and I reminded you in 2 Peter, that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. God always has a witness. Even today, the world's without excuse. You read Romans 1 one more time. And as you study and you begin to see how the deprivation of the world and there's just, it just builds and a reprobate gets closer and closer and closer and closer and closer till it comes to a point where it says, and they gave these things over until they believed a lie. And when they begin to believe the lie, it says they were without excuse. Now, folks, I'm telling you, we can say, well, the world just doesn't know. They chose not to know. And our world is choosing that, and that's the day we live in. There's always a witness. The message is there. It's just being ignored. Life goes on. Marriages, feast. Um, we hear the message. We're just not listening. And unfortunately, sometimes it happens even in our church. This translates to a, there's, there's no such person as God. Have you ever heard that, young people at school? You know, God doesn't exist. Or, you know, you can have a faith, but that's private. If, that, if you lean on that, or it becomes a crutch, it becomes something that, you know, a strong person wouldn't necessarily need to believe in God. And so we become quiet, and we become reserved, and we, we hide ourselves because we're thinking, in our minds, we don't want to be made fun of. We don't want to put ourselves out there, or maybe we don't know the argument or we're going to say the wrong thing. I'm afraid to witness because I don't want to push someone further away from Christ. Hey, can, I just, can I just address that one little thing for just a moment? It's really not a part of my sermon. So you really don't have to 
you really don't have to give for this reason right here, okay? Just, just take this for free. When somebody says something that is along those particular lines, they're, they're just saying, you know, you're going to push someone further away. I want you to listen to the argument about that. How do you get further away from God than being lost? I mean, if you're lost and you're dying and you're in your sins and you're going to hell, how do you get further away than that? Folks, you're not going to push someone away from Christ. If they're not close to Christ, you're not pushing them away from Christ. You're just declaring Christ. Now, I'm not talking about the way or your style or your, your emphasis on that. I'm not talking about you being rude. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm just saying, how do you push someone away from Christ when he first loved them? You, you can't do that. So if you think that you're going to say, you say, speaking about Christ is going to offend someone, folks, they are already offended by Christ, not by you. I, I'm just trying to help you in your witness. I'm not talking about you being in your face, but you don't have to back up. You do not have to back up. Just because there is a conflict or it becomes something in your family or, or something in your workplace, folks, that's not the issue. The issue is whether or not they've rejected Christ. And it's the same thing here as in the days of Noah. People have already become angry because of the things of Christ. One of the tenets of Marxism that we're facing in all of our socialistic versus uh, the Constitution and the things today, one of the tenets of Marxism is to do away with the deity of Christ. Everybody is a god unto themselves. You read and you look it up. I'm not encouraging you to, to read all of the tenets, but if you look at that, Marxism is based on that. That's the first thing. Change your education and change the fact that there is no God. Understand that. And so we're, we're living there. So it's not an excuse. Um, nobody was keeping them from knowing God. They chose not to know. They knew, but they chose to ignore the signs. So if you want to know what the signs are going to be, according to verse 3, when they said, what will these signs be? If you want to know that, here they are. Don't ignore them. And there are people today ignoring the fact, ignoring the fact that we have said there is no God and we want to run our lives the way we want to. We want to what we want and we don't care what God says. Now, the folks, is not, folks, it's not a problem that we live in a lawless um, society. It's, the, the problem is not that we shoot police officers. The problem is not that the news media lies to us. The problem is not in Washington or a deep swamp or a deep state or the immorality of our leaders. That is not the problem because all of those are dependent upon people. The real problem is, is we say we don't want to know what God says and we're not, even if he gives us an opportunity, we're not listening. We know, but we want to take down statues that might have Bible verses on them. You know, um, the issue is not the Jefferson Memorial. The issue is, is that if you go around the rotunda of that, uh, about every other column, there is a Bible verse. The, the problem is not the Washington Monument. I don't know if you know that, but at the very peak of that, there is a Bible verse. And we begin to think, oh, well, this is all about racism. No, it's about purging ourselves of any knowledge of God. So when you get to verse 39, it says, they knew not until the flood came. There are some people that are going to go around and say, we know what the problem is. We're going to riot. We're going to do this. We're going to have our own hedonism. We're going to be materialistic. We're going to riot. We're going to do all these things. And we're not really going to listen to the real problem. The real problem is, is we need Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior because the world cries, peace, peace, yet there is no peace. Folks, it's rather dumb that the Atlantic Monthly would say, let's do away with the Nobel Peace Prize because we have a president that's been nominated twice by foreign pagan countries' legislatures to be nominated 
to the Nobel Peace Prize. Twice, two different countries. And our own people say, no, we need to do away with the Nobel Peace Prize because we have a president that we don't believe should uh, have that. Now folks, I, I'm just saying, we just want to take everything and do it to our own understanding regardless of what anybody else believes. And we live in that day. We live in that hour. So, if you want to know what the signs are, at least don't ignore them. Pay attention. Understand where we live. Because you can know that the same careless attitude towards preaching and unbelief is coming. And it's coming judgment is going to be present right before the rapture. I mean, I sometimes believe as a preacher right now that we're so close you almost want to just hold your breath before it happens. Uh, that's, sometimes I, I just get that way. Uh, you know, have I ever told you I like roller coasters? Because why, why would you get to the top? You know, you're coming over the top and there's that moment right before you plummet down and they've already told you it's going to go 80 miles an hour or 60 miles an hour or whatever it is. They've already told you the degrees of what you're going to be. There's an 80 degree drop at one of my favorites and you just kind of get on that thing. But right before you go over the top, there's that tendency to just kind of <gasps> and hold it till you get to the bottom. Now some girls go ahead and scream. I get it, you know. But the whole breath thing is you know it's coming. Folks, as Christians... How can we not just kind of go, <gasps> knowing what our situation is and what the world is like and that it's coming? That's the sign of the time, as it was in the days of Noah. But the final assessment, when it's all said and done, is this. There are two kinds of people. Two kinds, those that will be taken and those left behind. So when we look on further, Jesus just begins to explore those two kinds of people. So it boils down to those who are genuinely saved and taken away in the rapture to be with the Lord at the, at the rapture, go through the marriage feast and go through the reward ceremony and, and understand that we'll come back with him to this earth in his earthly return. And, and uh, they, they say... That, that uh, they are saved and they're taken and it's evident because they are his. But then there are those who say that they are saved, but they're going to be left behind because they're trusting in self instead of a savior. One taken, one left behind. And Jesus is the one explaining this. Let's look at those that are taken in verses 40 through 42. It's, it's sudden. There's no time to change your mind. When you look at verse 42, the Bible says, uh, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Now the only thing that could make it more imminent would be if he said, You don't know the minute. But it doesn't say the day. It doesn't say the year. It says the hour. The hour is more urgent than a broader scope of time. You don't have to know the decade. There's an hour, there's an appointment, and it's within a scope that is small. And that's important. We don't know that. It's sudden. And there will not be time for you to make up your mind in the process. That is the thing. It's something to anticipate. So he says, watch therefore. Pay attention. Wake up. Read. Understand what... This, don't get hung up in the prophetic things, but do understand what is taking place. It's something to anticipate. And then continue in the work. Do you understand that it says two are going to be working in the field? It's not a time to quit. We don't get up here and get our bowl of popcorn and sit on the front porch and look at the eastern sky. That's not what happens. We continue to work with an awareness of what is taking place around us. And again... There's a clear notice that the exact time of rapture is an undated, it's a, on a secret schedule. And when it says this, because you don't know the day or the hour, two women are going to be grinding, two are going to be in the field, all of these things are going to be taken here. Watch therefore, because you do not know, what, you do not know the hour that the Lord will come. So... Those are taken. It boils down to this. Those are the ones that are taken. But what about the ones not taken? 
It seems to me odd, and I've mentioned this before, we spend more time dealing with what will happen during the tribulation time and the people that will be left behind than we do taking people with us in the rapture. Now, I will tell you why the Lord tells us a lot about the tribulation. It's a warning. Now, it's not a warning to people that are left behind because they're not paying attention anyway. I mean, if I went to Portland and I told all these people, you know, if the, if the rapture comes right now, do you know that you would be going through a tribulation? It'll be worse than all these things and burning and all this stuff like that. How many of those people do you think are going to listen to me? Zip. None. Nada. I mean, it's not going to happen. So who is this to? Well, the disciples, remember, are the ones that ask, and Jesus is in the conversation with them. So it has something to do with the urgency that you understand, that people are listening understand. Now, so let's don't be distracted. All this is taking place for the purpose of Christ's ultimate coming to rule the earth as a rightful king during the millennium. That's where it is headed. That's where this is going. And it is his right alone. Ezekiel tells us until he come, whose right it is, and I will give it him. Those left behind are going to be in a world that will for seven years, seven whole years, be totally under the influence of the Antichrist. Young people, that's longer than four years of high school. It's longer for some of you than middle school and high school. It's more years than your children would be in grade school. Right? It is more years than the average tenure of a pastor in an evangel evangelical church. Put that together and think about the continuing influence that we have. It is almost the duration, it's less than the duration of two terms of a president of the United States. It's not a long time, but it will be a terrible time. For us to be able to put those things together. Why does that become so important? Because you see, the issue here is, is you better be ready to go or be ready to stay. One is taken, one is left behind. But those staying are under a deception and deluded and will probably not get the full impact of what Jesus is saying here. So one final warning to not miss the signs of the time, and it comes down to verse 45. This is not the time to wonder about the future. It's not, because we know what's coming, amen? Hey, is there any question in anybody's mind of what Jesus is saying is going to take place? This is to be, this is the time to be engaged in the master's service. So we see two servants here. And that's, what is, that's what's taking place. One is wise and one is evil. First, the wise servant is taken. So the whole world is left over to the evil servants. Amen? Do you see that? What do you expect? I mean, if you want someone to be in charge, who do you want to be in charge? The wise one or the evil one? But at this particular point, after the rapture, the evil ones are left in charge. And we begin to look at this and scratch our head a little bit and thinking, I don't want to have anything to do with that. But if you're staying, you better be prepared and understand what is taking place. The wise servants are the ones taking. He's busy. He's diligently. He's doing. He's about what the Lord instructed him to do. When you find this in verse 45, who's going to be a faithful wise servant uh, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Who will that be? Who is going to receive the mercy of God so that at that particular time we know that we are going to be taken? then notice he's going to be rewarded. The Bible says blessed, and during the millennial age, he's going to be made a ruler. We see that in verse 46. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. He goes, but when he comes again, God has a job for you. God has something to do in his service because you've been in his service now. That is the faithfulness that God is calling us to in our day. But then there's the wicked servant, the one that is left behind. When we look at verses 48, we say that this is really not a servant. I mean, you can be employed, 
but you're really not loyal to the cause. You're really not being productive. There's really nothing that is being done in your service. Not really a servant of all. Because really when you say evil, it means deprived. It means depraved and, and of a bad nature. Now, I want you to think about this. If this person was a true servant, the Bible says he would be regenerated. He would have been made new. He would be a new person. So this person isn't saved at all. And if he had been new, he had had a different nature about him. You see, he, he has no real conviction about the Lord's return. He looks here and says, but if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. It's like, eh, I know he said it, but we'll deal with that later. It, it's, it'll take care of itself. Uh, or I will, I'll change when the time comes. We'll, we'll have plenty of time to make up our mind. There's no real conviction that there's an urgency about the Lord's return. He doesn't respect the authority of God over his own life. He doesn't take care of those under his own influence. He beats the servants. He's drunken. He, he's feasting. He's doing whatever he wants to do for his own gratification. And we read that in verse 49. And uh, he's taking others to hell with him just as fast as he can go. That's exactly what is taking place. He chooses to drink, to live in the pleasures of the world. Just as it was in the days of Noah. And we look around and we say, well, it's not as bad. It's not going to apply. Can I just say it like this? Just as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in 2020. Does that resonate with anybody? Do you see that? And, and a lot of times, folks, here, here's where, I, here's where I, I disagree with a lot of our fellow Christians. We want the world to be better instead of wanting the world to come to Christ. Are you hearing what I just said? We want the world to be better so we can continue to do what we want to do. But the real issue is, is we need the world to come to Christ. Now what will happen if the world comes to Christ? It's going to be better. It will be better. Is everybody always going to be saved and the world's just kind of going to go into this grand, grand and glorious time? No, it's going to wax worse and worse. I'm afraid to say that, but it's true. But in the meantime, the issue for us before the rapture needs to be one of warning. Are we confronting people about the love of God and his plan for their life? We, we say we want Los Angeles to be better, but what about the neighbor? Because their righteousness is as filthy rags, just like someone else. We want them to stop all the madness in Portland, and we want Congress to do something, but the real issue is God wants you to do something. Really. Honestly. God wants us to be at work doing what God wants us to do, and he wants us to do it now. So the return of Christ will be to him a complete surprise. The person that is left behind. It's going to be a surprise. He's going to be equally surprised at his sentence because it says clearly that he's, she shall be cut asunder, appointing a portion with the hypocrites, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What does that sound like? I mean, that's pretty adamant that those left behind, everybody says, well, I'll get saved during the tribulation. I'll just wait, but then I'll give my life to Christ. No, not at the threat of your life. If you're weak enough to do that now and you won't give your service to him, the Bible says you're going to be under a great delusion. You're going to believe a lie. Now is the time. Today is the day. You see, it's going to be an abrupt end, a sudden end. It's going to be a final end. The gavel is going to come down. Uh, do you ever hear somebody say, well, well, wait, let's just talk about this. Let's do another Bible study. Let's, let's, preacher, why don't you preach on uh, the revelation? Or, or preacher, let's, let's do a word study. No. I'm not saying we shouldn't, but 
Jesus is the answer, not another study. We've had the book of Revelation. It's been in the Bible for the whole time the canon has been in existence. We've had the minor prophets, haven't we? We've had scripture. We've had the words of Jesus here in Matthew 24 and 25. These are things that we've had with us. Another going over it is not going to change it. Your heart yielded to Christ is what will change it. And that's what we need to understand. Jesus is the answer. And he's the answer for one taken. He will be the answer as to why one would be left behind. It's not the situation of the world that is the problem. It's the situation of a heart. I, do, do I? You say, preacher, you just sound like you don't care. I, I do care. I, I don't want the world to be in the mess that it is in. I don't. I am not of the persuasion or the power to be able to change anything that the world is doing. But there are some people I can confront with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That I can do. And I have to understand that Jesus, I'm standing here with his disciples, and I have to understand that that is the same influence that God would have over me. So what am I going to do? In these end times, when I really believe that one's going to be taken and one's left behind, do I just say, eh, glad I've got my ticket punched? Or do I take the warning and realize that there is an urgency about people coming to Christ. Do I look around in a room like this and I see, you know, a third of the seats occupied and wonder, not, well, I don't know why those people aren't here, or do I think, you know, there's a lot of room for people that I could be bringing to Jesus. What, where's my attitude in all of this? Because you see, it's not just a matter of me being able to go. But what about the people left behind? Am I just saying it's good enough for me just to be here? Or do I need to be serving God? The warning was for the disciples. And for 2,000 years, that message has been going on. But we understand that it's closer now than ever before. Uh, We've had the sign of the fig tree. The signs of the days of Noah. One will be taken. One will be left behind. What's your response to that this morning? Is there something that needs to be done? Is there a new dedication? Do we just shrug our shoulders and say, Preacher, that was a good prophetic thing. I, I, you know, thanks for the information. Or is it changing our lives because God is speaking to us just like he did the disciples there in the shadow of the temple? What's going to take place in our hearts this morning? And how are we going to respond to that? Let's ask him and then let's do that this morning as we bow our heads. This is Pastor Ken Newport at Second Baptist Church. Once again, just thanking you for taking the time to view the message today. Messages from God's word always bring up questions, don't they? Some to the commitment, just like we've heard in the message today. Others are searching in our own souls about some things that maybe we're unsettled about. I found out that one of the questions that haunts us most of the time is, am I certain that I will go to heaven when I die? God's word is really clear about that. In fact, it tells us, these things have I written that ye may know that ye have eternal life. Let me just tell you what God's word says about eternal life. First of all, there's kind of an impossible situation. God says that only those that are perfect like him can enter. Revelation tells us that nothing that's abominable, anything that has blemish on it in any way, will be able to cohabitate in heaven with him. Now that sounds rather crass, it sounds rather limiting, but I would tell you that we wouldn't want a God that was anything less than perfection because we would wonder if he could really help us. But the truth is, we are helpless. The Bible teaches us that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Now, there's something that tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now we need an answer, but God has provided that. He says, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. What about this gift? God has says it is a gift. 
Who is that gift? What is that gift? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. There it is. That's the gift. His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It comes down to this. I need to recognize that God is great. I'm not. He has provided for me a way for me to be with him through his perfect son, Jesus Christ. And by praying to receive Jesus Christ and repenting of my sin, coming to the end of myself, then I have the opportunity to spend eternity with him forever. In fact, it's even a guarantee. The Bible says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. It's a gift that God has given to you. Now, I would just challenge you to just take a few quiet moments, review these things, maybe look on our website where I've printed out some of this information so that you can look it up in your own Bible and see exactly what God says. And then if you pray, I would love to know about that or any decision. Perhaps you're wanting to know about how to join a church or perhaps there's a situation of life that's a particular challenge and you want to know what God says about that. Check us out on our website and then let us know by contacting us there. The numbers are on the screen for our church and we want you to know that you can join us at any time in person. Would love to hear from you and meet you personally. Thank you for your time and God bless.